How do you that. manage your time then? Well, at the moment? Yeah. Well, I just have a long list of shit and then I just start ticking it off throughout the day until I get bored or distracted and then I <laughs> go and make a gin and tonic. So that's advice. <laughs> advice to a great time. No, actually. I'm... Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to our podcast. This is a true, raw, unscripted insight into our lives captured from our intimate diary entries whilst we're figuring out this path of traveling the world and building our own businesses. On this week's episode. For me, it's just about like trying, trying new things. And there's a big cuckoo bird in the background. Um, we're surrounded by chickens. For context, Ross is um, very sensible doesn't go on roller coasters, is always the one to hold the bags. It was both our first day on the job and we kind of got thrown in the deep end. Well, I don't really know. Um, I don't know. If he can do that, if he does that and I've just witnessed him, witnessed him do it, then why can I not do that? Here's the thing. Over the last three months, we've traded in all our possessions, jobs, hobbies, family and friends, Basically everything for two backpacks, two laptops and two one-way tickets out of the UK. Eight months ago, we were on our honeymoon and a small conversation completely changed the path that we were on. Since then, we've designed a life where we're slowly travelling the world and have the freedom of working for ourselves. This podcast is our most intimate diary. We're going to share with you everything that we experience whilst living this lifestyle from our deepest struggles to our highest successes. It's going to be personal, unscripted, uncomfortable at times, and we have no idea where it's going to go. We've committed to a path of uncertainty and cannot wait to document it and share it with you. Also, before we start, it's worth just giving a quick explanation of where we are to set the scene, uh, which explains some of the crazy noises that are going on in the background. (laughs) We are one week into our trip in Bali. Uh, staying in an Airbnb in Ubud. And we are pretty much living like a local, (laughs) a very nice place that is surrounded by cockerels, chickens, rice paddies, cats, dogs, rice paddies. The biggest spiders you've ever seen in your life. Literally right outside the window. (laughs) What else have we got surrounding us? Cockroaches. Yeah, a million mosquitoes, basically, which is why we're keeping the spider where he is. Basically, right in the heart of the jungle. And lizards. So con- lizards. Yeah, geckos in our room. In our room. Yeah. So constant noises. As we're talking, you will definitely hear the sound of cockles. <laughs> um, so we apologise if that gets irritating, but we want to start practising our new podcast. Yeah, and actually that in itself is a topic because we've been debating about whether this is the right time to do it because of all these noises you know at the moment we can't find a studio in bali or even a quiet space to just um get some of this audio recorded however we've decided that now is the right time and we will put this out because what we're doing whilst we're traveling i'm sure we're going to come up against this scenario a lot so it may be that our podcast comes with interesting background noises and hopefully that can just kind of add to the flavor of it. Um, like that one there. <laughs> um, but we thought it's much better just to start and get this out rather than think, okay, we'll wait for the best time. We'll wait for a perfect conditions. And you never know, uh, in a month, two months down the line, we may have moved on to something else. Uh, and this has dropped off because it's too difficult. So we want to get it out. We want to get some feedback. And we want to see how it goes, including animals. So, Ross, we're going to talk about something that Ross has uh, blogged about and has um, talked about before is putting yourself in uncomfortable situations. So do you want to start with like why or how this came about? this sort of way of thinking the other day we were in new zealand in uh, queenstown and this guy did a bungee jump uh right off the cliff and it's never something which i've thought i would ever do before uh do you fancy doing a bungee jump no but not because i'm frightened because 
I don't, I just don't want to do one. It just doesn't appeal to me. I jump out of a plane. Yeah. But what occurred to me is that when I looked at it, my initial response is that I, I, not that I wouldn't do one, it's that I can't do one. And he was such a cool guy, wasn't he? He just literally stood at the back of the platform and just legged it off the cliff. <laughs> it was absolutely epic. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> but I think, um, I was interested that my first thought was that I can't do it. And, and it's so easy to, to reflect and say, oh, you can do anything. Yet on that specific subject, I had an initial reaction that I could not do it rather than I did not want to do it. Now, the truth is, I don't actually want to do a bungee jump anyway. So I think that that's fine. That is fine. That is fine. But when you look at that guy, I kind of thought to myself, if he can do that, if he does that and I've just witnessed witnessed him do it and sort of expanding my thinking, if thousands of other people also do bungee jumps, then why can I not do that? Why, why did I think initially that I cannot do it as opposed to just saying, okay, I see him doing that and I don't want to do it. And I just think that comes down to a sort of a self-limiting belief, almost subconsciously. Okay. So why didn't you do it then? Well, no, <laughs> so, <laughs> I do, well, we were clo- I was close to doing it because uh, we, we, were, we went into the office, didn't we? And uh, there was an hour and a half wait and we had to go. Um, so I don't think that's an excuse, but I've committed that next time I'll do it. So I'm Googling, as we speak, bungees in Bali. Yeah, for Ross I'll do it. People. I absolutely will do it because, like I said, it's a case of overcoming, at, like we talk about putting ourselves in uncomfortable positions situations for me that is about me overcoming uh that self-limiting belief which when you rationalize it and when you really think about it it doesn't make sense but just for context so obviously um being uncomfortable is subjective and for some people doing a bungee is easy like the guy that we saw and but was it well that's interesting though was it easy yeah but on on looking back it looks easy yeah but just to continue for context ross is um very sensible doesn't go on roller coasters is always the one to hold the bags our (laughs) mates call him risk ross because he doesn't like to take risks we've been on beaches before and he's he is the 10 meters back from the um ocean because the waves are big and he doesn't want to get pulled in um yeah so for ross it's it's quite a big thing to do something like that because you have always thought of yourself as quite risk adverse well no i don't think i don't agree (laughs) naturally um risk adverse in certain scenarios i wouldn't say risk adverse in many many things like you know for example quitting a, a, my job and, and deciding to do this that's very very risky that's a new thing though effect. that's all, all going that's all yeah well it's all it's with, all part of it and that's why i thought it was it, it's an interesting topic because putting yourselves in putting myself in an, in an uncomfortable position when i look back now it's it's always what leads to you know growth or you know positive outcomes but at the time so when you said then that guy he looked like he loved it and he could do it so easily you don't you don't you almost don't know the backstory you know yeah. when when you kind of see um i don't know a professional singer um on stage and it looks so natural you don't know what they've been through to actually get to that point and so when i look back at loads of scenarios in my own life actually taking that step to first of all just be aware of the self-limiting belief and then say, do you know what? I'm going to experiment. I'm going to try it. I'm going to be uncomfortable and practice getting used to being uncomfortable. So obviously the bungee isn't an everyday occurrence for you or won't be. How do you think overcoming something like that is going to impact you every day in your everyday life? I I just think it's a mindset. I think um, if you look at you know, if I look at any of uh, any of the icons that I would potentially aspire to be, they have done some things which at the moment will be uncomfortable to me and probably was uncomfortable to them when they did it. So if, if I was to, I talked about progression, if I was to get to a position that they are in, naturally you, you have to embrace 
you know, this kind of trying new things and, and the, the feeling of being uncomfortable. Otherwise, you'll just, you know, I guess the, the biggest fear for me is that I'll sit still and be too comfortable. Uh, and that's kind of, you mentioned about, I, I've written some pieces, you know, I, I wrote a blog about failures. And I said, my biggest failure today is that I hadn't failed much when I, when I reviewed things about two years ago. Um, I felt that because I hadn't, I couldn't pinpoint like a failure. I thought that that was a big failure in itself because all it showed me is that I'd lived I, from what I'd been doing. It was too comfortable, you know, career wise. It was too comfortable. Learning wise, it was too comfortable. I hadn't tried uh, new things where I can clearly say, yeah, that went wrong. Um, but God, did I learn a lot from it? Mm-hmm. So I'm interested in like you're the little Ross, the little eight-year-old Ross, yeah. and the story that you told yourself and who you wanted to be when you were growing up and how you feel about that now, whether those thoughts are still changing or... I don't know, like, how do you feel about your expectations? I mean, we're both approaching 30 now. God. I know. So, uh, you know, have you met your own expectation? Um, I don't think I ever will. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm very content. Um, <laughs> this doesn't sound very good what? <laughs> well I'm content that I'll never reach my <laughs> what you mean great I'm doing a really good job then <laughs> no I'm oh yeah I'm so happy that obviously who I am as a person um absolutely you know there's no th this is probably going deep but it's not deep into the realms of I'm I'm unhappy as as a person I I'm very content with who I am and, and pleased with, you know, how I've, how I've turned out. <laughs> but, Thanks, mum. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, but there's, there's more to do. Of course there is. You know, there's things that I want to do. I want to um, learn more stuff, be exposed to more things. And I, I really want that to... I want to be able to look back as I do now and be, and be proud of what I've done. Um, and I just don't think that that... I almost don't think that you'll you'll ever reach the top of the mountain you know that's that's not because there's always something more mm. as well like the guy, coming back to the guy that did the bungee jump he he would be bored of that because it wasn't long enough mm -hmm. so there's me analyzing god i need to do a bungee jump well actually you probably find that when i do one the next thing would be to do a longer one a more extreme one and so i i don't think um, there definitely is a balance of are we just striving and striving for the sake of it and then um, you know what's it all for because you know we've only got a certain amount of time on the you know, like you say we're, we're getting 30 now so we're really really old and um, you know should we should we just be striving or should we just be enjoying and actually we've been having that debate haven't we because right now we're you know we're in Bali and we've been traveling for six weeks yet we actually haven't, we've had like, what, one day in the last four weeks and probably a couple of days when we were in Australia where we just chilled out. So our kind of inner debate is, should we be working? Like yeah, it, it, feel, yeah. it feels right that we do. And actually I'm very unsettled if I don't, but I don't know if I'm going to look back, if we're going to look back in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years time and go, God, when I was 28, why the hell? did I work whilst I was in Bali? Mm. Why didn't I just piss it up? And I'm sure there will be an element of me that does think that when I look back. Um, but equally... But then you won't be where you were, will yeah, be well, when yeah, you're exactly. you it's hard. Didn't. It's hard, yeah, because it's like, if I change the course now, you don't know how I'll turn out. So yeah, I think I've um, turned out as I imagined and I am constantly restructuring how... I, I see myself in, you know, the near future. Have you got some particular areas that you really... Because, yeah, you know, ev everything, <laughs> everything that we're talking about is quite broad. I want to get to a point. I mean, I've... Right now, I've left, you know, a, a well-paid job to, to come and do what we're doing. So I want to get to the point where I'm earning the same as what I did mm -hmm. on my own. Okay. Um, that's kind of, that's, that, that to me is like the bench, but that's the first step, you know, to prove 
that I can self-sustain based on, you know, things which I've created out of thin air or, you know, that, that we've created out of thin air as opposed to being, you know, relying on an, on an employer to give, to give me that monthly payment. So that, that would be cool. If I could look back now and be earning what I was earning before, and I've done that myself, that would be nice. That would be a nice, um, you know, proud achievement. And then, and then it would just be onwards and upwards from there. You know, I'll, I'll expand my thinking and it'll be about where we, where else we can take it. Mm -hmm. So it is all kind of your goals around money and building. It's weird that because it's interesting you ask that about money, because I mean, right now we're literally living like Kings for what 25 30 pounds a day eating mm-hmm. out three times a day in bali and we see th- these people that like are the happiest people ever yeah they really are the happiest people and they've got nothing at all so it brings a whole new perspective on money and i don't strive for money so just then it probably sounded like i am very money orientated but actually i don't have many things like I have, I've never had a nice car, you know, we, we, we love our house. Um, but I've had to sell like practically all my possessions to come here and we're living a minimalist life. So it's actually not about money. I guess it's about the pride that comes with money, mm-hmm. uh, but that shouldn't be attached to money. That should just be attached to, I guess, just growth. And, and when I see, when I see a couple of businesses that have started from nothing and, and grown, and I saw that a lot in my old job, kind of, you know, working with businesses from the 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 start and and seeing them them grow to a point where you know some of them are raising and turning over millions of pounds um it's exciting Mm -hmm. you know so it's not necessarily the money that comes with it money is just kind of a benchmark for success yeah i guess i guess so i guess so yeah it's the it's the pride which comes with it it's the pride because i know that to get there you'll have to do a lot of stuff which is new yeah. And and each one of the and it's the stories, you know. I I I just said then about when I'm eighty, what am I going to say when I look back? For me, I would love to be able to have a cool ass story. Like I think um, this is getting deep now, but I I I really I think everyone and I want to like write an autobiography and and I um. I thought to myself, what was it, like a year ago Mm -hmm. about an autobiography? And uh, I think I heard it, I think it might have been Richard Branson. He said he thinks everyone should write an autobiography. And the fascinating thing is, if you're to ask yourself what your autobiography would be like. What, now? No, no, no. Now, yeah, now or in years to come, Mm. would anyone want to read it? Would you want to read yours now? Um, maybe yeah but that's not that's not the point the point is a bit of self-reflection to say if you were to write an autobiography would anyone want to read it and so that in itself changes your kind of outlook on how you live life because wouldn't it be cool if it was quite a good story that i you know i've been i've been to a few funerals uh, and I, the, the best funeral i ever went to was it was a guy and i was going on behalf of um my workplace and I didn't really know this guy much. He worked part time for me, and I went to his funeral. And the guy there, it was like a family member that started telling a story of his life, mm. and it was a quality story. I was like, I was like blown away by the, the, this ten minute story that this guy had done so much, and he died when he was like seventy or something. And I thought, wow. I first of all, I didn't really get to know him, which is a real shame. Um, but secondly, how cool it was that he's got a really good story. And so when I heard that about, you know, the whole writing your autobiography, would anyone read it? The, the, the two kind of ma- marry up for me. And it's like, that should be an approach to life that you want someone to read your autobiography. Okay, procrastination. Oh God, <laughs> is that fav- because that you've a been a favorite up for topic an hour. of yours? No, I've been led in bed on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got up for half eight, did a hip workout, 
You were supposed to join me. No, who agreed to that? You said you were going to join me. Did I? Yesterday, you did. You did. You said you were going to go to the gym. Mm, I think you've dreamt that. (laughs) So, procrastination. What is your approach to not procrastinating? Mm. Um, Do you have one? (laughs) Yeah, okay. It depends what mood I'm in. Right. If I'm in a, a... positive motivated mindset how i avoid procrastination is to write out a to-do list yeah yeah so do you procrastinate oh yeah every day how much of how what percentage of the time would you say you procrastinate versus getting shit done 80 percent. what procrastinate yeah (laughs) okay and so your to-do list is working well no, it's not. Yeah, but th- that's the thing because I haven't been feeling um, not not motivated, but because I've been feeling very overwhelmed with everything going on. Yeah. Um, I haven't got my ass into gear to make the to do list to help me when procrastinating. If that makes sense. Okay. And um, why? How can you feel overwhelmed? Well, Ross. <laughs> Everything is just quite overwhelming at the moment from being here. It's not a negative. It's just, you know, a lot of change. Um, so from being here in Bali with you, having traveled for the last six weeks, that's a really, you know, that's a huge change that we're still adjusting to. Um, and then I've got quite a few bits going on, as you know, on, uh, you know, that I'm working on from a business point of view. Yeah. So that's why I'm feeling overwhelmed because there's just lots going on. So when you procrastinate, you're aware you're doing it? Yes. Okay. Because I don't feel good when I'm doing it. So what's your mindset when you're doing it then? And what do you do? How do you procrastinate? Oh, anything. So it could be um, from cleaning the bathroom to plucking my eyebrows to sitting on Instagram to doing other things that I don't really want to do, but I'd rather do that than get my head into work. Okay. And as much as this is clearly something you're still practicing. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I've been like this since I was a kid. Like I was the one that was up at 12 o'clock the night before doing our homework and stuff like that. So I've always been a very good self-sabotager. I didn't even know that that was a thing actually until... I don't know, it might have been Rich that, that said, and I, that said, oh, I'm good at self-sabotage. And I said, what is that? That sounds like something I would do. And then it all made complete sense. But it sounds like, do you feel it's massively dependent on your emotions then? Definitely. Okay. And what dictate, what, how do you find that you're dictated by your emotions? How do you control your emotions as a, as a female? <laughs> I'm better at it now, I think. After um, the book, um, How to Not Give a Fuck, and also um, a bit of reading on stoicism and things like that has definitely helped me be a little bit less dramatic and like if things outside of my control happen, before I'd have made a big song and dance about it, but now I'm a little bit more in control of my control in control of my emotions yeah. but you know time of the month or if we have an argument or if something you know if, if something has impacted my mood if I've not been exercising um if I'm hungry <laughs> <laughs> a big one no but yeah um yeah all of those things impact me yeah. And the thing is, because, I, because I'm a fine-tuned procrastinator and I know that I can get things done, then I do kind of leave it to the last minute because I'm quite confident that I'll get it done but probably could have done it well, do you think with that, a bit more time. Okay. Well, in that case, though, would you class that as procrastinating or just different time management if, if you're confident you get it yeah, done? Yeah, that's a good point. I just don't think I have very good time management. Like when, this morning said- I could have done something productive, but actually... I, I, and I remember a quote from when I was little and it was 
it's um if you enjoyed wasting time it wasn't time wasted and that always sits with me because I do like just sitting and being for a bit but I tend to do that a lot (laughs) which I know is frustrating for you and you're often on my back aren't you no yes you are (laughs) of course not so okay so what what has um what have you tried in the past? Because you've 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 tried a, a, a few different things, haven't you? And you've been—I think you've been aware, like you said, for a long time. Oh, that yeah. You like to brand yourself as uh, procrastinating a lot, mm-hmm. so you must have tried different things to improve that. Yeah, definitely. I've deleted the apps off of my phone. I've bought, you know, um, weekly planners, visual planners, set alerts on my phone given myself time scales, you know, throughout the day, but none of it tends to stick. I just end up back to square one, <laughs> sat in bed on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people can relate to that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I know. So is it, distra- is it just distraction then? Yeah, I think it's a whole mix of things. So I think it's bad time management and I'm quite a forgetful person. So if, um, if say... I'm asked to do something, I'll go, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I'll go off and then I'll do something else and then I might do something else that isn't about that. And then I forgot, it's gone out of my head. So when I sit down to work, I really have to concentrate because I think that's part of being a little bit dyslexic as well. I have to really, really concentrate. These aren't excuses, these are just understanding. You've been quite harsh on yourself. (laughs) No, it's just understanding. So I think... I've got a really focus. It's difficult for me to get my head into something because I've really got to get my head into it. Yeah. Because that's just how my mind works, particularly when it's something um, um, like literacy or you know maths. If it's something creative, or I've got to jump on the on a phone with somebody, or I've yeah, it's I, more deep. Like it's more yeah, deep work, isn't it? Yeah, which is all the work I have to do at the moment. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, so it's a little bit of me being a bit pensive about getting into work. And then I do like to procrastinate. I am not very good with my self-discipline. So, yeah, what do you think? About? My work ethic and my work planning and things like that. Uh, I thought it was a chance I interview you. Yeah, I know, but it's quite interesting to hear what you think. Um, Considering you, you've chosen this topic to interview me on, no, you well, obviously I, have I just, some thoughts. No, I just know that you generally say that you procrastinate a lot. Um, but what's interesting to me is that actually I think you you do get a lot of stuff done as well. So some, somehow, even though you're procrastinating, and I see, I do see that, <laughs> it's like like the fact you didn't join me for that hit workout um that's not procrastination though that's just being lazy yeah but you it, well yeah well I suppose the two are quite intertwined aren't they but I, I think there's actually a lot of stuff which I I look at you and I think you've done a lot in in a certain period of time compared to what I've done so I kind of sometimes benchmark almost my output based on yours yet you always go on about the fact that you're procrastinating mm. so I, uh, it's not necessarily the procrastination part that I'm interested in it's how you then switch on the um, you know the doing part yeah I guess I um, when I do have bouts of productivity and inspiration and motivation then I do get a lot done like um, a couple of weeks ago with one of the businesses everything in my head just clicked into place and I had a really clear vision around what needed to be done so I get a lot done yeah and perhaps because I'm jumping from business to business and they are all very different I feel like I'm not getting my head into things because I'm jumping from one thing to the other which I know that I need to stop doing because I don't think that that is the most productive Um, way of working and also you know I make silly mistakes and things like that yeah so so maybe you know it's an element of actually understanding 
what I've done. I'm also not very good at looking back and going, oh, fucking hell, look how far we've come. Yeah. I'm always quite hard. On yourself. Yeah, because I think you've you've got it in your head that you procrastinate. So as long as you'll have that in your head, that's how, you know, there'll be an element of that to what you do. Whereas if you if you did move past, I mean, it's not... Do you know what? I've read loads of stuff on procrastination. It's not necessarily about yeah, so thing, you have know? I. I think yeah. it's I think it's like yeah, and it's always quite uh, pleasing to read that, isn't mm. it? Oh, apparently cre- creative people are really procrastinating. Okay procrastinate. <laughs> but I do find the things that I procrastinate on are things that I think could get swept under the rug. Yeah, does it mean does it mean that you are I've not just got a ridiculous so when you, you, task yeah, list well, you've got of a stupid things to do list. Really need to do. Exactly. Yeah. So on your to do list, if you're not being strict on it and you're you've got a to do list of ten things rather than two dead important things, then you procrastinate on the eight. Whereas if you just struck them off in the first place, you you'd feel differently about doing like exactly the same thing. Yeah. I think your biggest thing is overwhelmed. When you get overwhelmed because you've got a lot of things on, um, that's that's the the time at which uh, I guess a distraction has got most chance of sneaking in. Yeah, definitely. When almost, which is the complete opposite time to when you want it to, isn't it? Like <laughs> yeah. I've got so much on, so I'll do nothing. Uh-huh. <laughs> Just because it's almost like a defense mechanism. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so we did record um, a similar conversation, but you spoke. Your questions were about how much I've got on and being stretched. Yeah, stretched too thin. Yeah, and we recorded that at the beginning of the week when I wasn't in the best frame of mind. Long list of shit. I'm not giving myself time to even think. Yeah, I'm absolutely shit at the moment. I'm really, really struggling. But I had a bit of a cry <laughs> a day after or something like that. Did you? Yeah, you know, sometimes you just need to. And, um, and then, and, and that's really because there's other people involved and I don't want to let anybody down and guilt weighs heavy on my shoulders a lot. Um, and, um, and those feelings of not being good enough, you know, starting things and then they're not going to plan and, and then that's all my fault and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but towards the later end of the week and we had a break yesterday we had a day off where we just literally enjoyed ourselves which is the first day of the entire trip that we have spent all day um without opening a laptop which is quite amazing really um so yeah I feel a lot clearer now and feel ready to get on with it rather than sat kind of being worried and concerned because you know what is that going to do okay and just um for, i guess for yourself listening back to this what what are the sort of things that you, that have worked before to help you focus on tasks and avoid procrastination that you think could be worth revisiting definitely planning your week so i do like to sit down on a sunday evening and look at the list of things that i've got to do work out what the must do's and then put them in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I also think that's good in our situation where we are here and we do want to go out and enjoy a couple of hours each day in the countries that we're in. So if I know that I'm working 10 till 4 or 8 till 3 and I have five, six hours of solid working, which is more productivity than I would have spent a day if I was employed... We then know that we can go out and we have we have those hours in the evening, which then, you know, helps you take in and be grateful for the journey that we're on at the moment. Yeah. So, yeah, so I definitely need to get into the habit and stick to sitting down and planning the week um, and not having the crap that's easy to, to do on my to-do that is actually things that are going to make a difference to the businesses and the people that are in them. So do you want to um, talk about what your thoughts were before we uh, decided to travel, like what your thoughts were on travelling as a whole? And then what changed your mind about 
about travel and the fact that we're here and why we're here. Yeah, because I, well, I, I always thought negatively about people that travel. Whenever I heard that anyone was going to go traveling, I thought that they were escaping something that they didn't like at home. So it was always quite a negative thought for me. And obviously a lot of people did the classic way of traveling where they save up an amount of money, they tour the world or parts of the world, and then at some point they need to come back and face reality. Um, and, and I've always been like really career driven and I just feel like taking that pause, I thought that it was a waste of time. I thought I didn't see the benefits of travel, but also I thought, as I said, they were escaping from something. And what I've learned is that actually travel doesn't need to be that at all. And, and that's why, you know, we're doing it now is because there's, there's a hell of a lot to learn from it. I think it gives you a, a, a whole amount of perspective as on like different cultures, as well as like all of the awesome experiences you get to have, but it doesn't have to be, um, a negative, you know, you're escaping because, because, you know, we're not escaping anything now, are we? No. We were, we were very happy with our, our lifestyle that we had, our friends that we had, you know, even our jobs that we had, we both really well, enjoyed our jobs. But I don't, but in my mind, I don't see it as I had, I have, I have a good house. Just have exactly. someone else yeah. living in it. I have amazing friends. I just feel like I'm adding. I'm not getting away from anything. I'm just adding. Exactly. Everything. And that's so true because it's not a case of we've left and that's that. You know, we haven't lost. We've left. We haven't lost. Yeah. You can, co you can go back. You know, I still talk to friends with technology. You know, we can FaceTime at any point. And but it's, it's more like we, we probably will be back in oh, the yeah. UK. I'm at, sure. At, you know. So, yeah, and we don't know how long this will be. So, you know, the whole that that's unknown in itself, which is quite, um, you know, exciting, I find. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you, you're dead right. I think it's adding. And so now I see travel. I mean, sometimes I, I do, I absolutely see people that travel to escape. And I think, you know, whatever you've, you, can't run away you need from to, yourself. yeah, you need to be happy <laughs> yeah. where you are. So, there's no point in just going somewhere else in the world and feeling like your your troubles will go away because you know it's just proven this is not going to happen um but it can be used for brand new experiences new perspective and just to add to what you've got because it suddenly occurred to me that uh like like we're born we're, we're lucky to be born in england and we've naturally sort of thought we'd live and stay in england but actually there's people born in other countries in Australia, in New Zealand and, you know, wherever. And they're also thinking the same thing, that they're going to stay there. And so someone might know a secret, you know, for example, Australia might be 10 times as good as England and we're happy in England. So that could be absolutely fantastic, but we wouldn't have known if we didn't explore and try it. Um, and so I guess we're, we're kind of, I feel like we're also on a bit of a Testing search out. for where yeah. it is best. Yeah, you know? we were driving through New Zealand and I said to Ross, it's amazing that like, and this is no, no, this is not derogatory, but it's amazing that our parents and our parents' parents didn't venture out of the um, counties or countries to see if there was anything better. I mean, even like the Peak District in Scotland, we were blown away by by those areas when we lived in the north um so that those generations didn't or generally haven't explored to see where's better to settle um because they have just settled for what they know and that's yeah. just quite i think it's a huge generational change though isn't it especially yeah. with tech and stuff tech and, and yeah, like, so like easy affordable travel yeah i so, mean the other night we drove back on our scooter and we got lost and it was pitch black and in 10, 20 years ago that would have been a nightmare but actually we just pulled up at a petrol station got in touch with our host and he came and got us <laughs> you know? yeah, exactly. it was no, no real stress at all yeah. in, the mid, in the sticks of barley <laughs> God so I mean I, I think um, I, I now view travel it very positively and I can see that you can add a hell of a lot to what you've got uh, as opposed to just escaping depending on your own circumstance of course uh, and and that's what allowed me to think yeah let's do it and also 
looking at what's the worst that can happen. Um, I think a lot of people, from what I hear, a lot of people see travel as like this l- absolute luxury. You know, a lot of people have got a vision of traveling the world one day, haven't they? And um, and if I, I sort of look at it now, and I think if people want to do that, what's the risk if they did it? What what's the worst that can happen for them actually doing that? And I think often not much. Uh, you know, for us, it was something we were interested to do. We'd realised that we can add a lot, and it'll be a good kind of experiment. And also, when you say, "Well, what's the worst that can happen?" Well, you know, we can always go back. We can always go back. We can always go back to the life that we had. Um, no problem. Okay, a slightly more personal question now. Um, how has marriage changed your life? <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny question from you, Ross. Um, okay, how has marriage changed my life? In terms of... Oh, shit, that's a long pause. Uh, in terms of, like, everything or in terms of working or... Yeah, with the work slant, but everything. Um, okay... Well, not much, to be honest. It's just the same. Yeah. I feel... <laughs> I think a lot of people say that. I mm, I feel a lot more part of you, which is nice. Not that I didn't feel part of you before, but I feel like it's kind of concrete. So, you know, just remember that. <laughs> no. Um, I don't know, it's really hard to articulate, really. Um, how has marriage changed my life? Has marriage changed your life? Has marriage changed how my was, life? How was your... When you look back now on the whole experience of getting married... Yeah, you know I'm quite opinionated about this. Yeah. Well, yeah, what was your opinion on it? Okay, so... Ross and I have been together since we were 16 and we're now 28. So we've been together a long time. And I nagged for the majority of that time about getting married. Um, My dad is on his fourth partner. I'm one of five. So really, I shouldn't believe in the whole marriage thing. But I really, really, really wanted to get married. And ever since I was a little girl, I thought about it and just couldn't wait. Um, Thought it would be the best day of my life. That doesn't sound very good, does it? Um, One thing a lot of people do. Yeah. Um, And, okay, so being very honest, we live like five hours, we lived five hours away from everybody. The wedding was small enough for me to deal with on my own and I didn't really ask for much fuss or didn't really ask for much help. And I just felt that the whole day you work so hard, I worked for two years to get it, as I kind of wanted it. Um, And there's a lot of stress and a lot of money. And I enjoyed the ceremony so, so, so much. Um, It was really, really beautiful. It it was just like how we normally are. Um, It was all very personalised, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, But then after that, you still carry on working. And I just felt quite lonely during... The rest of the day, like everybody else gets to go off and have an amazing time. And we had wonderful feedback. I feel like I'm the only one that didn't really enjoy it. Um, And I did enjoy it, but I just felt quite lonely because you're being pulled around here, there and everywhere. Ross and I got, um, got a chance to go off and have our pictures taken and stuff. And that's probably the only time I remember having proper time with you um, after the ceremony. Um, so the actual wedding, I just wish I hadn't built it up and I was quite a chilled bride, really. I wasn't, 
I think. I wasn't yeah. a bridezilla. I didn't, I wasn't demanding. I, I did everything. Um, so I wish I delegated a little bit more and was more prescriptive with what I, how I needed help. Um, and then, yeah, after I felt really bruised, <laughs> literally, my dress was very uncomfortable, but like emotionally as well, it just felt like it was done and it wasn't as I thought it was going to be. Like, I'm overwhelmed that we are finally married and I love being married to you. Um, I feel that we own each other more, which is completely the wrong word, but I can't find a better word owned in a very respectful and positive way I feel like you know I you're you're definitely mine now <laughs> if that makes sense <laughs> owned in a very positive cagey yeah, I don't yeah I don't, there's no words that that don't sound negative I don't know how to explain I mean it's it's nice there's no words really yeah um, I mean the padlock on the door <laughs> yeah the ball and chain um, yeah, I think, it's do, nice. Do you, not, do you think it's because of the expectation you had? Yeah, I, yes, definitely, absolutely. Do you think a lot of other brides feel this? Yeah. Have you felt? Do you know that? Yeah, a couple of people have said the same thing to me. Because you kind of build it up so much. Yeah, you build it up. It's and, a disappointment. And I, I am. Um, I love getting dressed up. I love being social, I love going out, I love having a drink, I like speaking, I like meeting people, and I thought I'd want to do the day over and over and over again, but I just don't. <laughs> I'm just so glad that it's done. Interesting. I know, it, I just don't feel as I was the other thought. way around. I mean, yeah. you, you kept saying that this is going to be the best day of our lives, and I looked at it very differently. I always said that even leading up to it, if that's going to be the best day. I didn't want that to be the best day of our lives. because it, You wanted to have lots of lots days. Lots of best days. It doesn't yeah. make sense to me that on the 9th of June 2017, that's our pinnacle day and everything else is, doesn't meet that, ex, that standard. Hmm. So, you know, I want today to be the best day of my life, tomorrow to be the best, or whenever. Yeah. Um, so my expectations were that it was going to be an amazing day with all of our loved ones and family around us. And, you know, it, it massively exceeded my expectations. Yeah, it was you a had really, a great really time. Great day. <laughs> um, so I, just, I actually think it's a lot to do with expectation. Yeah. You know, and, and matching that. Yeah. They say that a lot about travel. And more and more I look into travel is that people build up um, travel, you know, and, and places to be absolutely picturesque and unbelievable. And when you get there, it's never quite as good, which is a good thing. Because then the next place you go to, it just keeps you hungry. Yeah. Because if you hit that, if you hit that pinnacle, then kind of, you know, what's next? Yeah. I don't want to sound like it was bad. I. You had a great day. I did. Ha I did have a good day, but it, but I felt very emotional about it in, in not the best way. Because I felt lonely. I felt lonely and I, it felt like a very brutal day for me. <laughs> brutal it was brutal because because wow. you open yourself up so much to people and to you like our vows were very um emotional everyone was crying i think that i was just emotionally tired yeah well i think that's expected isn't it as yeah, well? yeah 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 so so the wedding yeah beautiful just advice to brides delegate and be very prescriptive with everything that you want don't just assume that it will happen um and do, do I feel different yes I feel I feel more part of you I love having your surname I love my ring <laughs> um and I feel very proud yeah I feel like it's a big um a big a big achievement to get married so yeah, um, and then how is it working whilst we're at here? Um, I'm very concerned about being a good wife. I Are like you? yeah, I and I do and I am all for the women, and and I know that you know in some marriages it's not always happy and women can be bedraggled by marriage, but our marriage is not like that, um, and 
I like to do nice things for you and then you like to do nice things for me and you build me up and I build you up but um you know like sewing holes in your the butt of your shorts and I like doing those things I like being I like quite being quite traditional in that sense but then also I like being a bit of boss as well much for listening to our first episode we have really really enjoyed putting it together and we hope you like it too we would ask one thing though we would absolutely love to have some feedback if we don't get any feedback we know we've done something wrong so good or bad we're we're big boys and girls we can take it on the chin um if you think anything's unclear or it was great or it was boring um or if you have any ideas we would really really love to hear from um, from you so thank you once again and we'll see you next week see you next week